B and crewed a nuclear submarine during the Cold War. But today, he's on a mission to transform Scottish football. So just who is Vladimir Romanov? Vladimir Romanov makes an emergency visit to Edinburgh. <laughs> Accompanied by his son, Roman Romanov, they are on their way to a late-night crisis meeting. Their recently purchased football club, Heart of Midlothian FC, despite enjoying their best season in decades, is in turmoil. Roman Romanov, the club's chief executive and chairman, briefs his father on their way to the pre-arranged rendezvous. Edinburgh's Balmoral Hotel. Also on his way to the crisis meeting is the Hearts manager and head coach, Graham Ricks. The relationship between owner and manager is in tatters. And Ricks, the fourth manager since the Romanov takeover, attends the meeting knowing that his job is at stake. Three days earlier, during the preparation for a league match against Dundee United, the difficulties between Romanov and Ricks came to a head over the sensitive issue of team selection. I gave them some advice on how to utilize the players more rationally, because otherwise we wouldn't last the long season. Romanov believes Rix's team selection is based on short-term glory, rather than the long-term aim of qualification for the European Champions League. But if all you're doing is pursuing your own goals, to make your name known, to show off that you can win the cup, write your name in history, it's better that you leave right now. Well, we had this argument, and of course I provoked him. I was pretty rude, I'd even say inappropriate, but I needed that provocation to see what would happen next. What happened was even worse than anybody could expect. Animals do better. Right before the game, they went on the radio. I just told him, if you lose the match tonight, forget about the position of the head coach. The game ends in a draw, stalling Romanov's pending threat of termination. You know, it's, it's like any job. If, if your governor is, is telling you to do something and you don't necessarily agree with it, then what do you do? I was stressed, to say the least, and I had to make some tough decisions myself and my wife, and uh, we discussed it and decided that it would have probably been easier to walk away from the situation. The tough bit was taking whatever stress and pressure came my way and seeing it through. I want to see this job through. I want to be mega successful, not only for myself, but for my staff, my players and, and Hearts Football Club. But uh, things had happened and, and they needed to be rectified. And, and it was going to be a tense meeting, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and thankfully, they have been rectified. I mean, it seems, you know, from, from our, can I just ask you, it seems from our perspective here that, you know, after everything that we've you know, been reading in the papers, that you obviously got on very well with Vladimir and, and Yeah, sometimes. 
<laughs> no, I do. They've been uh, they've been fantastic to me. They uh, gave me a great opportunity, and I'm and I'm delighted to be part of it. Long may it last. Yeah. They've got big plans, and I want to be part of it. So, I mean, Tuesday night is a hiccup in the way, is it? Yeah, I've forgotten about that already. I can't wait for tomorrow. Bye, Roman. Bye, Roman. Bye, Roman. Top man. Yeah. See you soon. Uh, See you. Speak to you. But the situation has only been rectified temporarily, and the decision on Rix's future is delayed by 24 hours. following day. Hearts are at home to Aberdeen in the Scottish Premier League. It's a must-win game, as the pressure to succeed intensifies. Adding to the crisis, the Romanovs have been contacted directly by the players, who have requested their own emergency meeting immediately after today's game. It's over halfway through the season, and Hearts are second top of the league, challenging the dominance of Rangers and Celtic. The race is on to finish in the top two positions, which ensures a golden ticket to the lucrative Champions League. Good luck. But just 18 months ago, the club was on the brink of extinction. The club was in terrible difficulties in 2004. Um, it was in huge financial difficulties, and they were planning to sell Tyne Castle, uh, move to uh, move the football to Murrayfield, and. Uh, be, as it were, tenants in a rugby ground. I mean, it was in a really bad state. Uh, the whole edifice was crumbling, effectively. Fate then intervened, and in the early part of 2004, I was asked to go to a meeting, which took place here in Edinburgh. In fact, it was in the lounge of the Carlton Highland Hotel. And I was asked to attend a meeting with a foreign businessman regarding hearts. I, I knew the people in the Foreign Office and our ambassador in Vilnius and made the appropriate checks to find out uh, his background and uh, uh, it, it, it was on that basis that I was happy f for him to be approached um, and I, I, I'm uh, convinced that he's not a shady character. I was taken aback at the start. I th thought to myself why should this Russian but Lithuanian-based businessman, ex-submariner from a Russian nuclear submarine um, from the days of the Cold War, suddenly want to come and buy hearts? Romanov had previously owned two other football clubs in Belarus and Lithuania and was eager to expand his football interests elsewhere, specifically into Scotland. After I tried and failed to buy in Dundee, although I really liked that town, and I heard a lot about Dundee United, and it felt like I could do something there with that club, then all of a sudden they told me, the people from the Federation, I mean the Lithuanian Football Federation, they told me that Hearts was in a really bad financial state, that it was almost bankrupt. They asked me if I'd be interested, and we got together with Leslie Deans. And there, at the table, we negotiated the purchase of the shares. As the second half against Aberdeen resumes, the pressure on Ricks increases to breaking point. I was getting stick from certain sections of the crowd and certain wags in the crowd. And I 
was getting soaking wet out on the touchline and I could have easily just shrunk away and hid in the dugout. But I've got to show my team that, you know, I'm there for them. Maybe it had had an effect on the players that maybe minds weren't fully focused on the job in hand and uh, we didn't certainly play to the levels that were standards that we'd set in previous games. It was a poor performance, really, uh, and, and certainly as regards the media, I didn't use it as an excuse, but I think what had happened in the previous ten days or so had, had got to the players. I think they've had a, a lot to contend with already this season, and I mean, publicly, I, I never said anything, I just said we played badly and had people off the pace, but if you look a little bit deeper, I think it's understandable. Aberdeen have beaten Hearts by two goals to one. Just hours after the game, the verdict on Graham Ricks's future is still in the balance. Deep inside the club's administration offices, the players plead his case. Stability was key, you know, we, we needed stability at this time. We believed in Graham and if you have a head coach at a club, then he has to have the right and the say in terms of team selection. And uh, I just felt that it was right that we, we spoke to Mr Romanov and expressed our you know, opinions on the matter and... Uh, support for Graham as well at the time? Yeah, of course we're in support of Graham, yeah, absolutely. Today we had a meeting after a turbulent week and uh, had a positive meeting, tried to solve problems and that uh, we get as a team would like to keep it inside and solve it as a family inside. I don't think they were there to represent me. I think I can represent myself. I just think they... They wanted to state their case, the fact that, hey, we're on the verge of really achieving something here. You know, why, why change things? Why get busy? And, uh, I mean, that's, for me, that's, that's a, a great compliment to myself, the fact that the boys trust me so much that they want me to, you know, keep doing what I'm doing. The players came to me and they asked me to wait with the sacking. I told them, OK, if you think so, I am prepared to wait, but I still think it's a mistake. Kaunas, the old capital of the former Soviet state of Lithuania, and home to 58-year-old Vladimir Romanov and his family. It's from here Romanov runs his multi-million pound empire, trading in oil, textiles, metal, construction, property, banking, and football. Kaunas has been home to Romanov since his Russian parents moved here when he was eight years old. My father was a military man. We came here in 1954. I spent all my childhood in that very house. There was a pigeon loft on that roof, the black one, there, between the two other ones. And a bit down you can see my windows, just behind the triangle, between those two chimney pots. That's my window. Under the Soviet regime, property ownership was illegal. People lived in collective housing, and many families, regardless of size, crammed into one room. It seemed to be so big then. It was huge. I even used to ride my bicycle here. 
Here, we had a big bed. And when we came here, father brought from the quarters, uh, he brought four stools. And he brought an iron bed. And a table. And that was all we had. Later, we bought a sofa, a double one, and mother and sister slept there and I slept on the camp bed. Aged 15, Romanov was catapulted into adulthood and sent to work as a manual laborer when his father died suddenly. After three years providing for his family, the young Romanov was forced to move on. All Soviet citizens, all young men at the age of 18, were drafted into the army or the navy or other military services. I went to the navy, to the submarine detachment in Kronstadt. All my values changed. I started to appreciate my home and my family. I realized I might lose them all one day. And I remember the mandatory training. Every six months or once a year, we had training with torpedo barrels. You get in, they put you in a torpedo barrel, open the hatch, water comes in and it floods. They put three people in at a time, three people to one torpedo tube. I was the last to get in. I got in, it gets filled with water. If you knock three times, they'll open the hatch and let the water go down and take you out. But while you're waiting, you can't be sure whether you'll be alive or not. I had water right up to my lips. So I turned to get air and I swallowed water. I started to cough and almost choked, but I refused to knock three times. I still sometimes have that feeling. I see it in dreams as if I'm in a coffin and being drowned in water. I think it was after that accident that I started to really appreciate what life on a submarine means, that it doesn't allow for mucking about. As an ex-taxi driver, I can show you around the town in my old taxi. After three years as a submariner, Romanov joined the Soviet fishing fleet. He brought back artifacts and textiles from all over the world and resold them for a profit back home. But family pressure eventually forced him back onto dry land. At that time, people who worked in consumer services, like waiters and taxi drivers, were a sort of elite when it came to earnings. I earned 30 to 50 rubles a day. It was big money. When I worked as a taxi driver, I used the money from that to buy knitting machines, and so my output grew. Finally, in the 70s, in the late 70s, early 80s, I became quite a big businessman. Today, just half a mile from his childhood home, Romanov and his wife Svetlana live in a modest one-bedroom, top-floor flat. <laughs> И вот такой, потому что он солнечный. Если его зажарить, вот тут он зажаристый очень. Он напоминает, если он он круглый. They've been married for 33 years, and during their early business ventures, Svetlana, aware their money-making schemes were illegal under Soviet law, was in a constant state of anxiety. He would come home with two full plastic bags, you know that type, non-transparent bags. So he would come into the room and throw these bags on the carpet. Roman was still small, and he'd asked me to count the money, 
I really didn't feel like counting them. Roman would sit down and sort out all the bills. Bills of one ruble, three rubles, five and ten. That is how we counted. Bags with money. My God, did we really have to do that? What a nightmare. Some nights, and I'm sitting at home, not knowing whether he will return at all. You don't know what to wait for. Mobile phones didn't exist, and there was no way to get in touch with him. So you just had to sit and wait. You sit and wait until night. I thought they could have arrested him. I was very worried. I was very nervous. Concerns for their safety were heightened when in 1982, the head of the KGB was appointed Communist Party General Secretary. Then Yuri Andropov came to power and he decided to destroy all the businessmen like me. I noticed I was being watched and I had a direct contact. A direct contact is when you have somebody following you three meters behind. You go to the bathroom, he goes there too. You get into the car and he gets into his too. After a while you get used to it, but it means you're under investigation. And the next step is you go to jail. And suddenly I was visited by a man from the commission in charge of watching all the businessmen. He was a Lithuanian and I knew him well. We were neighbors. He said he realized it was me when he saw the address. He told me I was on the blacklist. Basically, once you're there, nothing can rescue you because you're being watched and your case is given to the KGB investigation department. So I got my stuff together, put my skates on, as they say, and went to Dombai with Roman. He was still very young. I bought a hotel down there and started a hotel business. I forgot all about this business back here in Lithuania, and after a while, they forgot all about me. I have to thank that man from the commission who rescued me, because others got eight, ten, twelve years in the gulag. He is, I believe, in the nicest sense, a football nut. Um, he loves it. The first time he was at Tyne Castle, packed house, the atmosphere's magnificent. Even other clubs' directors say that uh, the atmosphere's great. It, it really got to him. It, it, it really turned him on. Romanov still has close ties with two other clubs he once owned, Minsk Tractor Factory in Belarus and FBK Kaunas in Lithuania, both now feeding players to hearts. Hearts turn in a confident performance against Motherwell, retaining an eight-point cushion over rivals Rangers, lifting some of the pressure from Graham Ricks, at least for the time being. In football, you know, it's always the next thing you're going to do, so we enjoyed last, last Saturday's result and performance, but then straight away you're thinking about the next game that's coming up, and it's a massive game, Partick Thistle, quarter-final in the cup. It's a big opportunity for us. Since the Romanovs arrived, the post of manager at Hearts has been the most talked about and precarious in British club football. And Graham Ricks is the fourth incumbent in less than 18 months. Craig Levine resigned just days after Romanov's arrival. John Robertson lasted six months and resigned rather than accept demotion to assistant coach. And George Burley sacked a third of the way through the season after guiding Hearts to the top of the league. Burley's departure is still the subject of speculation and legal scrutiny. But former chairman George Fawkes believes the disintegration of Romanov and Burley's relationship began months earlier. I think probably the genesis of the concern that Romanov had, it was the one all draw with Celtic at Parkhead, and we were uh, apparently set for a win, and it ended up as a draw. And Romanov was convinced somehow that could be contrived, and, uh, and he was suspicious about that. And I think that was the way in which his suspicion started. But it, it just was so uh, 
fantastic and unbelievable. Did he actually say that to you, or did he? Oh yes, oh yes. No, he, I mean, he was he was fuming about it because he believed that the uh, that the match had been fixed. Although Romanov refuses to be drawn in details surrounding match fixing allegations, he does believe that corruption is present in the Scottish game, particularly in relation to football agents representing players and managers. The role of agents in football clubs has become tragic. First of all, they don't want to know that there's a club with its own interests and ambitions. And a player needs to be nurtured, if he plays professionally, if he is a professional. And he fulfills his duty when, first of all, he puts the interests of his club, then his own interests, then those of the agent. Agents switch it all around. I have run into such cynicism, it goes beyond any extremes. The license of such agents needs to be annulled. It needs to be done immediately. We need to fight against such agents. Burley's departure, in turn, led to the sacking of the club's chief executive and the resignation of chairman George Fawkes, both positions immediately filled by Vladimir Romanov's son, Roman Romanov. The takeover now complete, the Romanovs search for a new head coach and promise the fans a big name. The new chairman of Hearts said he can understand the fans' feelings, but asked them to give Ricks a chance. Graham Ricks, former Arsenal idol, is not the star name the fans expected. And in addition to a variable track record at a coaching level, he comes with a troubled past. I will say this only once, OK? But uh, many seven years ago, I made a mistake. And once I realised I'd made a mistake, I held my hands up and I was punished. In 1999, Ricks became headline news when he was sentenced to 12 months in prison for illegal sex with a 15-year-old girl. What attracted me to him was his desire to work hard. I also liked his previous experience, the work he'd done before. But he was a man who'd been pushed into a corner. I wanted to help and support him, and he seemed to be a sincere person. When I asked him, do you want to manage hearts, his reaction was, are you serious, are you kidding me? I said, no, no, no kidding, try it. I said, no, no, try it. If I'd taken on a star manager again, well, he would have rebuilt the whole team. He'd have broken it up, brought in new stars, and then put it all back together again. But the team had already been formed. It didn't need to be broken up. The team was playing. It just needed an experienced manager who could take them into Europe and beyond. When I first came up, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, there was a lot of adverse publicity towards me and my appointment, and he really stuck up for me, and I admired him for that. Did you ever think that you were given the job so that he could have some leverage over your decisions? He owns a club. So if he tells the physio to do something, the physio's going to do it. If he tells the head coach to do something, he's going to do it. If he tells uh, the guy in the club shop to do something, he's going to do it, because he is the governor. Uh, like I said earlier, you might not always agree with what he says, but the bottom line is he's the boss. At his disposal, Ricks has one of the biggest squads in Scottish football, and during the recent transfer window, 11 new players were signed to Hearts, more than any other British club.
at his HQ offices in Kaunas, Romanov, still not satisfied with these recent additions, continues combing the planet for more football talent. These are the archives of the players that I can go through myself. I don't have all the folders here, but we can take any country. Let's take Scotland. All the Scottish players are here. How many have we got? 700. 700 soccer players. All the players we've got here, we've got their own characteristics, which tells us about the player's potential, their physical qualities, how strong they are. So when some player arrives from any country, we compare the data. I pay people for making independent evaluations of every player in every country. The players are individually assessed and graded, one to three, by Romanov himself and then logged and filed by his translator and personal football assistant, Artyom Chetverikov. How many Brazilians do we have altogether? Well, there are eight folders there. If there's about 700 in each one, makes about 5,000 players altogether. So we've got 5,000 Brazilians. Romanov is convinced that Brazil is the ultimate breeding ground for football talent. And he is currently part way through negotiations with Brazilian Roberto Di Adrandi, a registered FIFA agent. But Romanov is renowned for his unique bartering skills. You've shaken hands, what's the deal you've done today? I'm I, I, I going to bring next week a young player who plays in, in Vitoria and Bahia and in Palmeiras in Sao Paulo. He's 20 years old. His name is Fred Costa. And he's gonna resign already him for three and a half years for almost nothing. And he just put me out of the business. But that's okay. This could be the first deal. The next time I, I try to get him. We, we haven't been bargaining yet. No? Yet. No. 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 <laughs> For Di Andrade, the meeting is a success, and he arranges another sales pitch later in the week to discuss three upmarket players. One with a price tag of seven million Brazilian dollars, equivalent to two million pounds. The following day, Romanov travels to watch Hearts v Partick Thistle live on Lithuanian television. Team selection for every game is paramount to Romanov, and he's very concerned about a number of players recently brought to the club by Graham Ricks. We communicated through Roman, and Roman was telling me that the coach wanted to buy this player. He's not expensive, so let's take him. I didn't like the player, but, well, if the coach wants him, I say yes. Then we got the second player. I didn't like him either, but I still took him. I thought, OK, let the coach have his way and be comfortable. Then the third player appeared, and I was against him too. Why is he taking on all these players, I thought? But some coaches, in order to have influence in the squad, recruit their players, and then if something happens, they put their players in the field to sort of punish the other players. It's a ploy. So I was wondering whether he was going to play the same game. That was the situation, and I told Ricks to write down the characteristics of all those players, proving that they would measure up to the standard of hearts. Three weeks passed, and still he was too frightened to put pen to paper. Well, if he wasn't going to write it down, well, we all thought we had to punish him. He had to be punished. We had to rebuke him or something. Romanov has paid a Lithuanian TV company £3,000 to transmit the match live. So he and Sandro Gershevich, his friend and football advisor, can scrutinise the game. 
Although Romanov's target is to finish in the top two positions in the league, his secondary aim is to win the Scottish Cup. At the quarter-final stage, Hearts have drawn lowly Partick Thistle, a knockout game that Hearts should win easily. You know, it's a special thing, any cup competition, the Scottish Cup and the English FA Cup, uh, big prizes. Midway through the second half, and with victory in sight, the tactics start to go wrong. Ah, Partick come within a whisker of forcing a replay. The coach is too hesitant. It seems that he can't, he can't find his game, he can't find his style. He's searching, he's hesitant. He's making mistakes. I'm not happy with the game, but I am happy with the result. I just think we're lucky to finish on the winning side. I agree with Vladimir. It's back to the negotiating table in the search for new players. And waiting in the outer office is Roberto Di Andrade. So Vladimir's got a good eye for footballers, would you say that? Yes, yes. He's, his feeling is very good. Yeah. I, I give him a punch of resume. And he got fused, and they say, I want to see this and this and this. And always he picked the, the right guy. We pretend go for the, with uh, uh, these negotiations. We're going to bring some Brazilians to play here, to play in Scotland. Oh. And the 7 million player, was, was Vladimir going to buy the 7 million player? Uh, <clears throat> we just discussed this now. But this time round, Roberto is going to find things a little tricky. We're going to show a part of different games. Roberto's strategy is to hike the price of the player worth 7 million to 10 million. Since uh, soon Carlinho Vala go to the south, Rio or Sao Paulo, his value will go up to more than 10 million easily. No, I have no question about it. But there is great confusion as to which players Roberto is actually trying to sell. Jose oh, Henrique lost that. What, what is his number? Jose Henrique, I can't say his number. Ten. Ten. Jose Henrique is a ten. Which player? This is Jose Henrique. Ah, okay. Which number? As the atmosphere heats up, Romanov's strategy is to attend to more serious business matters in the outer office. We, we don't see the whole play. We have to see the whole match, the whole game. Yeah, you see, uh, the, the TV in Brazil don't allow us to have the full take. And then what you see here is a part of We need the whole match, how the player plays from the first minute till the 19th minute. Na, the first, so till from the beginning yeah, I know. till the I know. end. Yeah, almost, almost of the guys in Europe don't want to lose um, ninety minutes watching a, 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 a whole game. Mm -hmm. He just want to see his skill, and those guys know have someone over there. He can tell him right now who are Rosenbrick, who are oh okay, that's it. Так и по этому Сильва Юниор, он уже старенький. 
we can we can talk talk about uh, about possibility to make a purchase, but without transfer fee, just to pay for his for him as salary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The meeting ends abruptly, without agreement and without any of the usual formalities. Yeah, you see, um... <laughs> It's it's uh, it's a quite uh, strange uh, when s some guy supposed to know football um, talking about the quality DVD quality. The quality of his DVD was terrible. No, he didn't have the proper CVs all these players, and it's quite hard to make some de decisions when you have such kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that is why, that is why I think, I think he was so upset. You're not happy. You're not, I mean, I can see you're not happy. Yeah, I, I really am not, because um, I come here to show a footballer, not a DVD quality. I'm not uh, like you. My business is another business. I know it's difficult for me talking, if you don't mind. I don't think that the agent was that upset. As they say, his salesmanship lacked sophistication. His techniques were too vulgar too primitive. At Hearts we need to get two or three good strong players because we haven't got substitutes for several of the positions. But if I find a good worthy player it really doesn't matter how much I have to pay for him. Seven or ten million? I'll pay it. I'll pay the money. Two hours drive from Kaunas is the Kuronian Spit on the Baltic coastline and a holiday development part owned by Romanov and adding to his fortune of almost one billion pounds. A fortune that began to amass when the political climate in Russia abruptly and unexpectedly changed. So, after that time, after the cruel Soviet period, then came Gorbachev, the Gorbachev era, Perestroika and Glasnost, and Rishkov, his prime minister, brought in a law on cooperative enterprises in the Soviet Union. I quickly realized that for me, for people like me, it meant that now I had a legal right to supply factories and my other plants with materials. During the economic transition, the government privatized state assets by printing millions of share certificates and then distributing them amongst the workforce. These shares, worthless on their own, but valuable in large numbers, gave businessmen like Romanov a golden opportunity. When we had the privatization bill, I bought shares or vouchers in factories, and I ended up owning those factories. 
And those factories turned out to be the owners of the UKIO bank shares. And I checked my shares again and again, and I saw that I had almost enough to own the bank. So I, I got myself into 10 years of hard work on all the results of my business and my trade businesses, and all of it I put into the bank. Tens of millions. And all the banks in Lithuania, they all went bankrupt. Not one stayed afloat. In fact, the only bank that survived was my bank, and I'm rather proud of that. As for the football, the director of one of the enterprises we bought said that the bank had just bought this huge factory, so why didn't we also buy the factory football club? I said, OK, let's buy it. And that's how my 15 years in football started. Then I started to ask, well, why is our budget three times bigger than the champions and we're not the champions? We're in fifth place. I started to get into the details. Romanov transformed his local club, FBK Kaunas, from losers to winners, securing six of their last 12 league championships. And through FBK Kaunas, Romanov was introduced to Scottish football. I got to know about Rangers with the UEFA Cup against Kaunas, and then Celtic, and then the Scottish national team came here. Then I looked at a lot of different clubs and I realised that in principle my knowledge and experience was enough to buy a club and to make them champions. But the championships, not the main thing. Just through the league, through the Scottish league, I wanted to get into Europe and then do something meaningful there. Romanov's drive for European qualification intensifies as Hearts and their nearest rivals, Rangers, now just six points behind, meet in a crunch game at Tynecastle. The match is beamed live on television and watched by Romanov while abroad on business. The match ends in a draw. At the post-match interview, Graham Rick seals his own fate. I was delighted with the lads, their attitude and they, they battled and we scored a good goal. I thought it was a good movement and, uh, yeah, overall, I'm not too disappointed. But Romanov is furious, contacts his son and relays explicit instructions. It's almost like a bombshell, you know, eh? we were stunned by the news. It was a normal day and then, um, you know, Roman Romanov uh, called a meeting. Well, the decision was made, so I came to inform Graham about the decision. And he came out onto the training ground to, to again, uh, you know, explain to the the players that Graham and Jim Duffy would be no longer at the football club. And five minutes later, the manager and Jim came down on the training ground to say their goodbyes. And uh, it was quite emotional. He was obviously disappointed, yes. Everybody was. You know, ourselves also quite disappointed when it didn't work out. Ricks, well, why I liked him at first was that he was being chased by the media. And I thought he'd side with me because of that. But he had some kind of advisor, some kind of secret advisor. And I could tell that the advice he was receiving was affecting the playing tactics. Then Roman told me that the coach wanted an assistant and it was hard for him to work with Valdas, the Lithuanian assistant at Hearts. And I told Roman, well, let this secret advisor come out into the open and take the responsibility for it instead of sitting like a rat in a hole.
Valdas Ivanauskas was brought here from FBK Kaunas as part of the coaching staff 11 months ago. But today, he's catapulted into the spotlight, becoming Hearts manager number five in just 18 months. Finally, Valdas, you've been a, a top player in Germany, Austria, Russia as well. You've played for some very demanding coaches. Is Mr. Romanov the most demanding person you have ever worked for? Valdas's first major game in charge is the Scottish Cup semi-final playoff against Edinburgh rivals Hibernian FC. I want to see if the team starts falling apart or not. I want to see how my changing the manager affects them. Often you get a period after such a change when everything seems to be falling apart. I want to have a look. I want to see them play. I want to see if the guys have still got that spirit, that combat spirit, and how they look on the pitch. The semi-final takes place at the National Showpiece Stadium, Hamden Park which means a migration of an estimated 40,000 supporters from east to west. victory for Hearts, ensuring a stay of execution for Valdas and a return to Hamden for the cup final in six weeks' time. For Romanov, success on the pitch is matched by a striking vision for the whole Heart of Midlothian enterprise. This is just one plan, which would allow for 25 to 28,000. We could rebuild this whole side, but even that wouldn't be enough today. So we're also planning to build a hotel right here. And the area between the stadium and the hotel, there'll be a glass dome there. And we're planning to put a conference hall there, that kind of thing. So it'll be more like a kind of sports culture center rather than just a stadium. Because the fans here, they're not like anywhere else. They're special. They're more intellectual. They're real football connoisseurs. I see families coming here with their children. We need to build it for them. Something suitable for their needs. It's been a long and turbulent season for everyone connected with Tynecastle. But despite the troubles, Hearts are now just 90 minutes away from realizing Romanov's ultimate dream this season. Qualification to the European Champions League. But first, they have to win. It's the most important Hearts match in decades, and Romanov's team are up against difficult opponents. The team that won here just three months ago, Aberdeen. After 76 minutes, it's still stalemate. But Hearts are awarded a penalty. Rangers and Celtic have occupied the top two league positions. 
But tonight, the old firm monopoly is about to be smashed. In just 18 months, the club has been saved from liquidation and progressed to become part of the European elite. One of the most remarkable transformations ever witnessed in British football. It's been a turbulent season. Some bad things have happened and we've had some lucky breaks. But after all that, I make a promise. I promise to build here a new stadium. And it'll be a stadium with the best atmosphere in the world. I really believe in this, and I have no doubts about it. And as for the future, well, the dream for me will be to bring the cup back to Edinburgh. That would be a great ending. Just 10 days later, Romanov's dream is realized when Hearts win the Tenants Scottish Cup. The narrowest of victories, ending in a penalty shootout against Gretna, a team two leagues below Hearts. Soon, they'll have to face the greatest football teams that Europe has to offer.